Hey, this is Mr. Clements from First Tech Challenge Team 9779, the Pie Eaters. I've also been a robot inspector and field inspector in our league here in Central Florida. So I thought I'd make this video on the robot inspection process in hopes that it can help you get your robot ready for inspection. This is intended primarily for rookie teams, but veteran teams might benefit from this as well. A good reminder. So I'll try to keep this video short. We're going to cover some of the rules that can be found in Game Manual Part 1. Um, the, these rules may change as the seasons go on. We made this for the Relic Recovery season. Um, game Manual Part 2 might also have rules that are game specific. But we want to talk a little bit about why it's important to be ready for inspection. And then we'll just hit on some of the common things that happen at the inspection table that might cause a robot to have to be sent back for more work. Now it is important to note that this is a video just to help you out, get you ready for your competition day, get you ready for your inspections. This does not take precedence over the rules. If I say something that contradicts a rule that you read, go with Game Manual Part 1, Game Manual Part 2, the forums, those are the um, authorities on the rules. When you get to your inspection, the robot inspector is your authority. Don't use this video as an example to argue a rule. You'll have to go back to Game Manual Part 1, part two or the forum to make your point because this video has zero authority. So why be ready for inspection? You know, we see a lot of teams show up and their robot's not ready for inspection or maybe they think it's ready for inspection but it has still has a lot of problems. Um, it's important to be ready for inspection because you'll be less stressed out on the day and you can just have more fun, relax, and have a good time. Another thing is if robots are ready for inspection and they pass inspection quickly, we have more time. That lets us have more time for matches, which equals more matches. And it's way more fun to play five or six or even seven matches than it is to play three matches in the day. So if we can have our robots ready and get them through inspection quickly, we have time for more matches. And it also means we can finish the day up a bit earlier and not have to go way past schedule and everybody ends up super tired. So it's nice to show up for inspection prepared. How can you be prepared? Well, luckily we have this robot inspection checklist that you'll find at the back of Game Manual Part 1 in the Appendix B. Actually use the checklist. Don't just go through and check off all the boxes so you can hand the sheet to your robot inspector. Use the checklist. Go over your robot line by line and make sure all of these things are done. This is the exact same sheet that the robot inspector is going to use to check off your robot. So if you can check off all of these boxes on the inspection sheet, then your robot should pass inspection no problem. So let's start looking at some of the specifics here. Um, the robot sizing. We all know the robot has to fit in an 18 by 18 by 18 cube. Um, I think the best way for me to illustrate some of these points would be to jump out of this document. So what you can see here is I have this amazing robot over here. Again, in the real world, you'd have to worry about length, width, and height. We're just going to talk about the length here. We have our 18-inch arrow over here, and I have a second arrow that I can actually move. Let me grab that. And as you can see, if I run it across, here's a wide point here at the wheels, and I can run it straight across. I can't go up or down, like I'm not allowed to do this with my arrow, right? And I can just run it straight across. Let me make sure I got it lined back up. Boom. I have to run it straight across, no up or down, right? And you can see that we fit into the 18 inch cube. Great, right? Okay, so let's say that we add a wedge tool on the front that's gonna push some junk out of the way. You can see now that it no longer fits, right? So, but hey, what if we move it up like this? Now, a lot of teams might do this. You might measure your robot at this point and go, hey, it fits in the 18 inch cube. And then you might take out your tape measure again. You might measure it over here and go, hey, it fits in the 18 inch size. Well, unfortunately, like I said, you can't move up and down. You have to go straight across like this and it would hit there. Or if we measured it here and move straight across, it would hit the bottom wheels. You see down there, it's hitting the bottom wheels. So this robot needs some work. Um, boy, it'd be nice if it was j this easy, but we're gonna do it just for fun. I'm gonna take my back wheels and I'm just gonna move them up the robot a little bit like that. And now you can see that, let me get my measuring line again. You can see that the actual entire robot fits inside what would be the 18 inch cube. So measure at multiple points and make sure you don't move up and down. Remember, it's a cube that we're talking about. So now another thing, um, I made these high level graphics here. Let me turn them on. I've added a motor controller and a servo controller with these fancy cables sticking out of them. Um, now. Cables are flexible. Cables are easy to use, uh, move around. They're easy to manipulate. So as you move your tape measure across here, we're hitting the cables right down at the bottom. Um, 
So a lot of teams will say, oh, well, I can just bend those and make it fit into the cube. The reality is it's where the robot is at rest. Nothing can be pushing against the 18 inch box. So you could pull that cable back and zip tie it and make it stay within the 18 inch frame, but you can't stand there and hold it to hold it within the 18 inch frame. In fact, now that we're back to the presentation, um, you can see this piece of advice that we were given, which if your robot were inside a magic sizing cube, so here's the magic sizing cube over on the right, it's 18 by 18 by 18, and, and your robot's sitting in there. If the magic cube just magically dissolved away, it just disappeared, nothing on your robot should move. So in the case we were talking about before, if your robot were sitting in there and, the, and you had a cable pushing against the box, and the box dissolved, that cable would spring outside of the 18 inch. Your robot would move when the box dissolved. So keep that in mind when you're measuring your robots for 18 inch sizing. So hopefully that clears up all the sizing issues. Um, okay, next up we'll talk about sharp edges and corners. Um, you can see this metal on the left. It has some pretty rough edges there that if you ran your finger down, you could kind of cut yourself. The one in the middle, certainly if you weren't paying attention and rammed your hand up in there and it hit your skin could cut it and then all these materials on the right over here you can see they have pretty sharp corners as we have to cut all our materials of course we're going to end up with sharp edges so get your file out round off any edges any sharp pieces anything like that basically what the robot inspectors are going to do is they're going to run their hand over every surface of your robot and if they feel something rough that they feel might scrape or scratch somebody then they're going to ask you to get your file out and round that off. Basically, we're worried if our field technical advisor has to run in there and do something in your robot and they put their arm up in there and it brushes against something, we don't want them to get scraped or cut. We want everything to be nice and smooth. So just feel every surface of your robot. Make sure it's super smooth. When in doubt, file it down even more. Here you can see on the left, we filed down all those corners. They're round. They're not going to cut anybody. And on the picture on the right, you can see on the left was a sharp edge. On the right is it's nice and rounded over. Again, just using a metal file. In the past, we've had some USB strain relief problems. Um, basically, anywhere you have a USB cable plugged in, plugged into your phone, or you're using the Rev Expansion Hub, or your modern robotics controllers, anywhere the USB connectors go in, they can vibrate out of place and cause connection issues. They can get pulled out of place pretty easy, and your robot dies out on the field. As you can see over on the left, there's a phone with a cable just kind of dangling out there. That cable will probably come loose and cause you to have connection problems. So here's a couple of simple solutions. In the center there, we have a little, it's just some Tetrix flat pieces with a motor hub, and we zip tied through them, and that would hold the, the cable in place, or there's a 3D printed part on the right. Here's a 3D printed. You can get it out at uh, thingiverse.com. One of the gracious teams has shared their design for um, some USB support for the expansion hub. There's also a lot of other 3D printed strain relief solutions out there. You can certainly zip tie your connection somewhere like maybe two inches from your con connection point. If you get further than that, then the cable can still come unplugged and it doesn't really help that much, but zip tying near the connection point certainly works. Worst case, you could duct tape it, but hopefully you've come up with a better solution by the time you get to the inspection table. So when you're deciding where to place your phone, um, remember a couple of things. Don't mount it directly to metal. These phones transmit radio frequencies to each other and metal blocks radio frequencies. So if you mount your phone directly onto a piece of metal, it can cause interference. Um, also, don't surround your phone with metal. If you have too much metal around it, it can interfere with the signal getting back to your driver station. And then thirdly, make sure your phone's easy to access. This isn't just for your team to access the phone. Your field technical advisor, if for some reason your robot's having a problem and the field technical advisor has to get to your phone, he or she's going to need to get to that screen to work on your robot. So the phone needs to be right there, easily accessible. The screen's easy to get to and easy to visually see what's going on with your robot for those uh, field technical advisors. You'll also see mention of entanglement issues. What we usually look for um, for entanglement issues, mostly just that your cables are pretty tidy, that they're tied down. You know, you have cables running through your robot, power cables, encoder cables, sensor cables, all these different things. If they're just sticking out everywhere, well, it's possible for another robot to get tangled up in those cables, and it could pull your cables loose and create a mess. So, so if you just tie down your cables, make sure they're secure and look pretty neat. Those are happy cables, and you probably won't run into any entanglement issues. Next up is the power switch. In the Relic recovery season, it's required to have a power switch. So check your game manual and make sure that's still a requirement. Um, 
couple things make it easy to find and easy to access. It needs to be there. So again, so if the field technical advisor needs to power your robot off, they need to be able to get to it, turn it off immediately. And that's why we label it with this sticker. Make sure it's mounted on a flat surface right near the power switch. It needs to be super easy to see and recognize instantly. Don't wrap it around a cylinder. Don't wrap it around something. It needs to be flat and right next to the switch so someone can instantly find your power switch if they need to. We also have the servo stickers. If your robot has servos on it and you've programmed your servos to move when you hit the initialize button on your driver station, then you'll need one of these stickers right next to that servo to indicate that it's going to move when the robot starts. It is possible your servos might twitch a little bit if you haven't programmed them to move, and that's okay. You don't necessarily need a sticker for that, but if your servo's out of position when you hit the initialize button and it moves into position, you definitely will need one of these stickers. And we'll talk just a tiny bit about team numbers. Your team number should be on two sides of your robot, opposite sides of your robot, either front, back, or left, right. You can't have them at 90 degrees to each other. They have to be on opposite sides. And the idea there is that anybody that's watching your robot from any point on the field would be able to see your team number on that robot. So the rules are pretty clear that your numbers need to be at least two and a half inches tall, and they should have a stroke width of 0.5 inches. The stroke width basically, if you look down at the bottom down there on the seven, if you had a big marker and you just wrote your number with the big marker, that marker should be leaving a line that's at least a half inch wide. And that's kind of what they mean by stroke width. Um, if we go to this example, quite frankly, these numbers would probably pass most inspections, but you should be really careful because as you can see down at the bottom of the nine, it tapers off. That is certainly not a half inch stroke width there these sevens taper off near the bottom. They don't have a half inch stroke width down at the bottom. So if you had a really picky robot inspector, they could certainly ask you to go back and fix your numbers because your stroke width isn't a half inch. And the last thing we're gonna talk about are the flag holders. Um, this is really easy to overlook. It's one of the last thing teams typically add to their robot. It's a pretty simple thing to take care of. The idea here is you should be able to put the Alliance flag into your robot, everyone can see it, and then at the end of the match you can pull it right back out. So make sure you have something to hold that flag. And that should give you a pretty good idea of what to expect during robot inspection. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down in the comments section and we'll try to get back to you. Uh, good luck out there.